Welcome to uh, lecture 78, where now we'll talk about the effect of symmetry on second rank tensors. In last lecture, we talked about principal axes and about how to uh, line them up uh, with, um, uh, with diagonalization. Now, one thing we didn't mention was whether it's possible uh, to do that uh, uh, with respect to certain crystal symmetries. So let's take the triclinic case. In the triclinic case, it turns out that there is no symmetry. And so all elements in reference to our Cartesian system are there. So I'm just drawing that out for you here once again. So uh, now every tensor can be diagonalized, but what you have to realize in the triclinic case is that if we do that and we go to a diagonal, somehow we're actually giving a tensor symmetry that doesn't represent the symmetry of the crystal. For example, if I uh, said, oh, I can represent it with diagonal, how is that possible? Because the triclinic system doesn't have that symmetry. So it seems like we're kind of, because I know mathematically I can find always uh, this, this diagonal. And the answer uh, comes from uh, the fact that, uh, yes, you can always find the diagonal, but if it's not a cubic system or a system that has that kind of symmetry, then uh, the reality is, is that uh, what you're doing is when you diagonalize, you're going to pick a coordinate system that's not Cartesian. So if we're going to stick to a Cartesian coordinate system, then indeed uh, you cannot get uh, something across this diagonal for a tensor like this uh, because it's impossible. I mean, the triclinic, there are no uh, symmetry elements that would that would cancel these off diagonal elements. Um, so if you were to force diagonalization on top of this, you would actually end up with uh, some sort of axes, you know, x1, you know, x2, x3, or something that. Um, we're not, we're not Cartesian. Now, um, we've done this example before, but I want to make it a little bit clearer, is that if we actually um, uh, uh, now want to have the tensor represent the symmetry of the crystal, uh, we could do that just by taking a generic case here uh, and then applying the symmetry elements to it uh, by looking at transformation of axes. So here I can't do that because there are no symmetry elements. So this is it. In the triclinic, I can measure all these and it's filled and, and there isn't good, the, the, the tensor is not going to represent any particular, uh, uh, you know, symmetry. But let's look at the first case of a decent um, symmetry, the monoclinic case. And we've kind of done this before. We were trying to show you the... Um, the uh, uh, the transformation of axes, right? Remember how we said, aha, uh, if I take the twofold axes and I put it along x3, so let's put our twofold axes along here. What that means was that I have to be able to rotate about here, so x2 recall, would go in the other direction, x2 prime, and then x1 would go in the other direction, x2 prime, sorry, x1 prime, then x3 prime is the same, and is invariant. Now the way that, that you see that is remember that we have our, our, our aij, just like I've drawn over there, 1, 1, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You know, it's completely filled, right? But remember, uh, what I do is I create the transformation matrix, Cij, uh, which, recall, in the case of inserting that two-fold axis, it means uh, that x1 equals minus x1. So remember, we had a minus 1, a minus 1, and a 1, because x3 is the same. 
So these are the directional cosines. Cosine of 180 degrees is a minus 1, right? And so that was our transformation between x1, x2, x3, and x1 prime, x2 prime, x3 prime. Remember that I have my aij here and my cij of the transforming of, of the axes. Remember, this was of the axes. Now we've got to remember our little transformation where, remember, our uh, aij could be transformed by... Let's call this AIJ. It's going to be the new one. And this would be I. This would be J. L. M. And so this would be L. M. Right? And remember, we showed how this remember implies the sum. And so I can multiply this out for each element. And remember, I have these two C's. Right? And the result. Uh, you recall from doing a monolithic case uh, was that uh, remember whenever you have it's zero except for a C11 or a C22 and those are both a minus one and a minus one right and then there is a case where we had uh, C33 would be a plus one and so what that meant was um, if you're on the off diagonal and I mix it and I have a 3 with either one of these guys, you're going to have a negative 1. And remember, the properties have to stay the same when I rotate 100 180 degrees. So how could it be that in one direction it's plus and the other direction it's minus? And you recall we had to set those equal uh, to 0, right? So you can see that in the case of uh, a monoclinic, you're going to end up with if I've chosen for convenience to put the twofold axes along the uh, the x3 direction, because this is a 1, 3, this is a 2, 3, this is a, a 2, 3, and this is a 1, 3. So anything that mixes the, the one that's the 3 with uh, one of the other ones, they're going to have to go to 0 because they're going to flip sign because you're going to have a 1 and a minus 1. And so you're going to end up with A being the uh, flip sign. Now, of course, uh, if I, uh, if you look at Nye, they line up the, uh, uh, they line up the twofold axes with the Y axes, which I'm not sure why, but this is with X3, you know, parallel uh, to uh, twofold, right? Uh, if we put x3 parallel, uh, sorry, uh, um, you put x2 parallel to twofold, uh, you'll end up with same number of zeros and everything. It's just that this would be a11, this would be a22, and we would have a. 3, 3, but you'd end up, and you'll see this in, in books when, when they're trying to show you the symmetry, uh, this would be an A, uh, 1, 3, and an A, 3, 1, and then zeros and zeros and zeros and zeros, where anything with the 2 and the 1 would be uh, 0. So it depends on where you put the the uh, the axis. Personally, uh, we I tend to put the con the convenience of it is that I put the uh, twofold axes along uh, always the high symmetry one along x3. Uh, so you can do the same exercise. In fact, let me show you. Um, so in the monoclinic case, we have used a transformation of axes by placing this on x3. We all of a sudden see that we are left with a lesser number of elements 
that are possible. And these went to zero because upon rotating 180 degrees, the properties can't change. They need to be invariant, and therefore um, it automatically induces some symmetry um, on this tensor, again, assuming this uh, alignment. So let's look one step further. Let's look at the orthorhombic case. which you may recall uh, is has another two-fold axis, right? Actually, it's got, of course, three, but uh, what we can do is just look and say, well, um, if we just add one more, what kind of restriction does that place? And so let's go through that thought experiment now. Let's just suppose, remember this is x1 and this is x2. Uh, let, us, let us suppose that, um, you know, now, I'm going to place uh, along x1 another two-fold axis so that basically x3 moves down here, x3 prime. And then, uh, of course, if I rotate like that, that means this guy comes over here. And I have x2 prime being over there. So again, I had monoclinic, but now I'm adding another two-fold axis. It turns out, of course, we know from uh, the previous part of the class, I'm going to get another two-fold over there, but let's just consider that um, alone. And so if I uh, now look at that, I say, aha, well, I've, I certainly already start off with this because this symmetry has reduced the, um, uh, the elements because of this two-fold axis. And now if I look at the orthorhombic one, remember that uh, with this blue one, the transformation is written this way, right? Because again, the direction cosines between the new and the old axes. So let's look at some of the, the, the let's look at A12 now. So A12 prime uh, after this transformation is going to be C1M, C2L. So the 1, C goes over here, the 2 goes over here. A, M, L. So that's going to equal C11, C22, a, 1, 2. <clears throat> so, of course, if you look at C11 and C22, that's going to be a 1 and a minus 1. And so that means that this is a minus A12. Now, it's supposed to be invariant, so basically it can't be positive and negative at the same time. The only way to do that is to make that 0. Uh, and you'll see that if you do the a similar derivation a11 prime is invariant it stays where it is so that's fine that actually stays the same and the same thing for a22 so the bottom line is for orthorhombic uh, we actually end up with an a11 an a22 an a33 and all these can be different but we end up with zeros everywhere else. So now we're starting to find out, aha, uh -huh, here is one particular system where now um, I end up, if I'm lined up with the high symmetry along these axes, I end up with uh, the thing uh, I'm having uh, these components on the diagonal. Of course, again, I can fill these other ones if I make those two-fold axes along some other direction, which is not the uh, the uh, alignment of these with the Cartesian coordinates that I have here. Well, uh, it turns out that uh, um, we can finish this pretty rapidly now. Let's just clean this up. If I look at if I look at um, uh, any other axes, a threefold, a fourfold, or a sixfold axis alone. So, for example, uh, and you could do the exercise yourself, 
uh, you could find out that um, if you put just just any of those axes in there, you'll end up with something very similar to the monoclinic, except that I'm going to put in quote here a12 because it's not different now; it's the same. This with the new symmetry that's forced. The other thing is that the a11 is also forced to be uh, the same, and then we have an a. 3, 3. So the number of unique uh, is reduced to 3. There's only 3 unique elements in this, uh, this pattern. And finally, of course, there's the most symmetric case of all, which is, you know, a lot of common materials, of course, in this category, cubic. And if you put all of the uh, fourfold axes and everything else in there. I think you can start to see now with this exercise how uh, when we put all these rotations on top of each other, all these symmetry elements, uh, you know, to make the properties invariant um, as I, you know, do those transformation of axes that the symmetry elements demand, uh, obviously I have to drop quite a few um, uh, more and more, I have to make these these uh, tensors more and more symmetric for these, you know, these, I've been all talking here about tensors of the second rank, right? So hopefully that gave you a, a, uh, a nice intro into how uh, uh, the symmetry elements being added um, cause a tensor uh, to lose uh, elements and become more symmetric um, as you uh, are forcing in different directions rotations and those rotations must make the properties be uh, invariant for those crystal systems.